Good morning. God bless you. How are you? Hey, we're hearing a lot of great reports here at the District Resource Center about Easter last weekend. So congratulations to you and congratulations to all of your teams and praise God for all the great reports and all the great victories. And I hope that you have a great plan for this weekend, utilizing all the momentum created last weekend coming into this Sunday. I want to conclude a series of teachings I was doing with you about leading in a time of spiritual conflict. And I want to uh, put a, a final lesson on that, lesson four, uh, on that topic. And we have uh, said to each other each week of this particular set of teachings that it's very, very obvious that we're in a time of increased spiritual conflict and that we need to be aware of some things as we are leading ourselves, leading our families, and leading our congregations, and leading our communities through a time of increased spiritual conflict. And when we talk about spiritual conflict, it's important that we set a good baseline because this is one of those topics that has a tendency to get a little bit messy and sometimes even a little bit weird if we're not careful. So the biblical baseline that we have set in this study has been this, that spiritual conflict is a reality. And we use 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 on that, that we are equipped to fight this battle spiritually. And that's Luke 10, 19. And the Lord is fully engaged in the battle for us and with us. And that's Deuteronomy 28, 7. And that we should expect always to be victorious in spiritual conflict. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. And Isaiah 54, verse 17. One more thing I want to add uh, this week, as I have each week of this series, to our baseline is that spiritual conflict is something that finds its way into both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's something that is throughout all of Scripture that we see the reality of spiritual conflict. And so we know that it's an expected reality in the day and age that we live. And it's nothing exceptional. It's been going on since the Old Testament and it's found its way into the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 is a premier scripture when we're talking about spiritual conflict. And I want to read that one to you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Can I remind you that our strength is in the Lord? We don't bring a lot of strength to the table to be able to combat things spiritually in our natural selves. This is something that we need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, second time, put on the full armor of God so that the day when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. So, the devil's schemes. The Greek word here is method, strategy, craftiness, planned, deceitful procedures. They are intentional. It is our struggle. It is not just people we're battling, but principalities and powers. There is armor that's been given to you because the battle is intense. And the goal is for you to remain standing after you've been in one of these conflicts. So to finish up our baseline study, we're looking at the schemes, the methods, the strategies, the craftiness of the devil. So when we put on the full armor of God so that we are able to stand against the devil's schemes, we've been identifying some of the devil's schemes because in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 2, 10 and 11, it says we don't want the devil to outwit us and we are not unaware of his schemes. The first week we talked about uh, our thought life and then we talked about unforgiveness and the power of unforgiveness and the danger of unforgiveness. Today I, I want to talk to you about a few more areas that we identify as the devil's schemes. The first one is isolation. Now, I told you in the Old Testament and the New Testament there's spiritual conflict that's represented. In Genesis chapter 2 18 the Lord said this, it's not good for the man to be alone I'll make a helper suitable for him. Friends, in all of creation, everything was good. It was identified by God himself as very good. And the first thing in all of creation that wasn't good was for somebody to be alone 
and God went to work on loneliness. He went to work on isolation as the first problem in the creation of a new world and a, and a race of people. God started working on this idea of isolation and this idea of loneliness. This is such a big deal that God is going to, in the New Testament, give us the Holy Spirit so that we have him with us always. One more battle plan to be able to make sure there's a helper involved that fights isolation. Isolation is always your personal responsibility. If you're isolated, you're the one who has to fix it. You cannot be in an isolated situation and also criticize people for not reaching out to you or calling you or coming to where you're at. The chances are very, very good that they just simply don't know. Isolation is one of the schemes of the enemy. He plays on this and plays on this and plays on this. And friend, there is no way that we are as strong, isolated as we are when we're in fellowship. Another one of these schemes of the enemy that we need to identify is intimidation. Be self-controlled, 1 Peter 5, 8 says. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The intimidation on this topic, the intimidation of leading today, the intimidation of what's going to happen if I do this or I do this or if I preach this or if I don't preach that or if I say this to my congregation or I don't say this to my congregation. Intimidation is starting to creep up to an all new level amongst leaders and Christian uh, 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 pastors in churches and missionaries. Intimidation is one of those things that just sits there and it has a constant baseline in our life. And it's one of those things we need to be aware that the devil uses intimidation to hold us and to render us ineffective. And then there's manipulation. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Manipulation. The manipulation of the truth. The manipulation of what God has stated over your life. The manipulation of questioning your call. The manipulation that gets played in your mind and in your internal conversations is something that we certainly are aware of that the devil utilizes as a scheme in our lives. And then there's condemnation. Condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 puts it very succinctly. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Condemnation is completely different than conviction. Condemnation is one of those heavy, ugly, nasty, dark feelings that pulls you backward into what you were, where conviction always pulls you ahead into what you're intended to be. Condemnation, the devil says, look at what you did. You're not good enough. You don't measure up. You don't qualify. And conviction says, you did it wrong, but I know you can do it better. I, I built you for something better. I built you for something greater. Let's do better this next time. The conviction of the Holy Spirit versus the condemnation of the enemy. The enemy use, uses condemnation to render us ineffective in the battle. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It is not God's desire that you walk around under a blanket of condemnation. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows that's 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. My friends, we are in a time of increased spiritual conflict. And it's a time in which you and I are called to continue leading self 
leading family, leading the church, and leading community while we are engaged in conflict. The things that make us susceptible to schemes of the enemy are our personal fatigue, our personal insecurities, and broken relationships in our lives. I would encourage you to rest. I would encourage you to be secure in his mighty power. And I would encourage you to repair the relationships of your life that are broken. Let's not give a foothold to the schemes of the enemy. You are equipped for victory. You are equipped with armor. You are equipped through an all-powerful God who is completely aware of you, has placed a calling on you, and enables you for every good work, and so that when we're in battle, you will remain standing. God bless you, friends. May this Sunday be a day of great victory as you revel in the, in the Easter successes, and as you celebrate those Easter successes, may today be a great day in your camp. God bless you.